Listen to the new Thin Green Line podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Game wardens John Norris and Wayne Saunders talk about wildlife, the outdoors, law enforcement, environmental subjects mixed with current events and guests that are part of the Thin Green Line. And if you are one of those visual people like me, for $5 a month, you can see the actual podcast on Patreon.com. Just search the Thin Green Line podcast on Patreon.com and join us. The Copper Pig Brewery in Lancaster, New Hampshire, is brewing traditional and innovative high-quality beers, as well as serving a large menu of creative comfort foods, appealing to all walks of life, with daily specials sourcing many ingredients locally. Charitable involvement and support of their community is the cornerstone to the Copper Pig Brewery's mission. Voted number one in New Hampshire by WMUR Viewer's Choice two years in a row, 2018 and 2019. Please join me at the Copper Pig. Guidefitter is the industry network for professional outdoor guides and outfitters. The trusted destination for consumers seeking and sharing guided hunting and fishing experiences of a lifetime. And the enterprise influencer marketing platform for outdoor brands. Guidefitter and its members represent the pulse of the guided hunting and fishing industry. Guidefitter's outdoor partners provide discounts to select types of outdoor professionals, including game wardens, members of the military, guides, outfitters, and other outdoor professionals. Over 145 brand partners and counting. Gear across many categories, including packs, footwear, clothing, flashlights, knives, optics, even firearms and ammo. For more information, go to guidefitter.com slash wardenswatch. That's wardenswatch, all one word. I'm game warden Wayne Saunders, and I'm a member of Guidefitter. We love our children. We protect them. We guide them. We prepare them for life in the world. With all that we do, from deep in our hearts, we cannot control all things. Life-threatening illnesses and disabilities affect far too many of our children each year. While we cannot change the circumstance, we can make dreams come true. Dreams to provide hope, to provide spiritual healing and strength, to provide moments of happiness and relief in the hardest of times. We can give a glimmer of light and hope in a time of darkness and despair. Join huntofalifetime.org to help make dreams come true, to provide hope for children with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Hunt of a Lifetime is a nonprofit organization fulfilling dreams for hunting and fishing trips to youth 21 and under with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Visit huntofalifetime.org to learn how you can make a difference. This podcast is brought to you by Maine Operation Game Thief and Wildlife Heritage, a foundation of New Hampshire at nhwildlifeheritage.org and International Wildlife Crime Stoppers. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun, all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experience of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from game wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion, the commitment, and the stories of those men and women that call themselves Game Wardens. This is Game Warden, Wayne Saunders, and this is Warden's Watch. So episode 40, 40, we're going down to Maryland to the eastern shore and then inland with uh, former Game Warden and historian Greg Bartles. I was asked to go down to Maryland, John, to speak at a Wildlife Crime Stoppers Maryland. They, they, that's what they named Maryland OGT, Operation Game Thief, is Wildlife Crime Stoppers Maryland, which, again, I think labels it. It, 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 it gives it that special thing as you know what it is, Wildlife right. Crime Stoppers Maryland. So they did a fundraising thing that they asked me to be the keynote speaker at Annapolis. So it was a, quite an honor to go down there. Along my way, I stopped and did some podcasting. And one of the places I stopped with Greg Bartles, the historian who has changed a building, one of his own buildings, as a museum. It's, it's, it's quite an amazing, very amazing place. It was uh, to be surrounded by so much 
history of the Maryland DNR. He actually has a jail cell in there too. You go to the bathroom, you got to go through uh, a, a, the, the jail door. It, it's pretty amazing. And history is so important to know where we've been, where we're going, where we've come from, to learn from our mistakes, to learn from our positive impacts, to see our successes. When we talk about the oyster wars down there, which was huge at the beginning of our country, the 1800s into the 1900s, oysters were a commodity on the East Coast that were so right. important. It's, it's you know, that history part is just uh, something that I gravitate to, and I know I think a lot of game wardens gravitate to as well. Yeah, there's something Greg brings to the table on this is um, something that's unique and traditional. You know, the oyster wars, some of the historical value of all the stuff he's put together. And some of the stuff we don't see over in the central part and the western part of the nation, you know, where, where my career history was. So um, especially our West Coast and Middle America listeners and viewers are really going to get a kick out of this because it's so unique and different uh, that you don't see in other parts of the country. But it just shows the diversity and how thin we are on the thin green line as game wardens. Right, Wayne? Yes. The, probably the podcast that's going to follow this, I hope is uh, Senator Jack Bailey, who is a state senator for Maryland, former game warden, who tells some other stories that are pretty interesting as well. It has that game warden uh, politician type thing. Love it. (laughs) Recording was a little rough, I will say that. So I've got to review it to make sure uh, it's going to be able to be aired. So hopefully uh, that'll that'll be next. That was just just an honor to be down with the, the Maryland game wardens and to see their history, to be a part of their history, to sit down with Greg Bartles and have him tell this story of the beginning of Maryland right up through. And the guy is so knowledgeable. Just It just blows my mind away that he could rattle off dates and agencies and the blending of agencies that they did. Because a lot of our agencies had you know separate agencies. They, they had like three different agencies, the, the park, the marine division, and the inland, that all came together over time. And that's what makes up Maryland DNR today. Love it. This one's this one's a, a real real fun one, man. Episode forty already. Yeah, it's great. With Greg. Greg Bartles. It's like Bartles and James uh, wine coolers from way back when, and that's how he he reminded me how to say it. And uh, I'll never forget your name now, Bartles and James. Uh, <laughs> Greg Bartles, Maryland DNR. And I'm going to call you a historian because I've been dealing with a lot of historians lately. You're a retired game warden, but you, you've brought all the Maryland DNR together as far as the history goes. And just to say, I walked into a museum today and I was overwhelmed by the amount of information that Greg has, the amount of stuff. It, it just got me excited uh, to, to learn more about Maryland uh, law enforcement. And Greg has been a wicked asset to that. So thanks for joining me, Greg. Oh, well, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. And well, how did how did you get in? How did you want to be a game warden? Where did you start? Where's your roots as far as uh, starting the job? I mean, where's that go? Well, I grew up here in Western Maryland, and I hunted and fished and did a lot of canoeing, but I uh, had very few, if any, encounters with the uh, game wardens, and never really considered it as a career option. I worked for private industry after high school, and uh, one of those industries was a good-paying job, but I kept getting laid off frequently. So during one of those layoffs, I took a position with the Maryland Wildlife Administration, uh, working with wildlife habitat restoration and, and nuisance animal complaints and things like that, and met, uh, really, as an adult, my first uh, game warden through that opportunity. And... Um, decided I would take the test that that Maryland was offering about that time for the position of natural resources police officer. I took the test but didn't do well enough apparently and never never heard anything from the state. So I went back to work for private industry for a few more years only to be laid off again. And by then I'm approaching 30 years of age and realized I needed to find a real career Mm -hmm. that uh, wouldn't be at risk of being laid off frequently. So I thought that my first wish would have been to be a natural resources police officer. So I applied there and then applied to some other law enforcement agencies and was hired initially by the local sheriff's department as a correctional deputy. And uh, while working for them, I tested and was interviewed for a position with the local city police department, Hagerstown Police Department. And I went through their academy and uh, worked there for 13 months. And while in their academy, I tested for the second time for natural resources police and did very well that time. February 1st of 1984, I started my career with NRP. 
And taking that first test probably gave you an idea of what to study for the next test. And because I took the test twice as well. I mean, I wasn't the first time game warden either. And I think, you know, to have that determination to go back the second time and test, I think that, that, that says something for somebody too. Well, ironically, as I recall, the first test had a lot of things about the geography of Maryland and things that I just didn't know how to answer. <laughs> uh, the second test had more criminal justice-related questions, and I was in the middle of Hagerstown's Police Academy at the time. Wow, So I was nice. getting pretty much paid to study for the test that I was about to take for NRP. Mm -hmm. So I did, again, very well on that test. And a lot of routes begin for game wardens in local police departments, sheriff's departments, correctionals. It's getting that you know, that beginning information that, that helped you spring on to, to being a game warden. I think that's a good career choice for when you're waiting. Right. Get but, that experience. Yeah, it was great experience working for Hagerstown, but my, you know, working as a street cop in the city uh, just wasn't my forte. I, mm. I wanted to be a conservation officer and was tickled to death when I had the opportunity. The woods were calling. The woods were calling, although ironically, I didn't really start in the woods. I, yeah. I started on the Chesapeake Bay in a, in a, on a 42-foot patrol boat and, and several Boston whalers uh, awesome. riding the waves of the Chesapeake, uh, dealing with the commercial watermen. And that's what I think of Maryland when I think of uh, Maryland. Yeah, that's what I, Chesapeake Bay, the shore. And yeah, it sounds like you started off just the way I would perceive a Maryland DNR police officer starting. Well, at that time, that's what everybody had to do. I, again, I grew up in Western Maryland, knew nothing about the Bay, nothing about the oyster police, the oyster wars, or the commercial watermen, and it was a great learning experience. I enjoyed it immensely, but uh, the mountains were still calling. Mm -hmm. But you started down on the, on the coast, so g give me some of those first years of uh, working on the Chesapeake Bay, working oyster fishermen, the watermen. That had to be something unique, especially coming from the mountains and being thrown into the salt water. Well, it was or a, brackish. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, it was unique. In fact, uh, I I sort of did it in jest, but it it uh, came back to haunt me many many times in the following years. Uh, the first time I approached a commercial waterman, of course, I was just a trainee with another officer and uh, looked in the deck of the boat. It was during oyster season. He'd been hand tonging and had a big pile of uh, oysters in the boat. And, I jokingly said, what are they? You know, muddy rocks. And uh, so that muddy rocks comment uh, was <laughs> brought up to me many times over the over the following years. I mean, I knew what they were, obviously, but the only oysters I had seen prior to that were from Campbell's Stew. So, uh, and, so. and hand togging, it's like, like a rake with a hoe or it's, pulling them up? It's actually like two rakes that have, that have a pivot in the center, and the opposing rakes are, are used like a scoop. Okay. And so the watermen, uh, depending on how deep the water is, have rakes of different lengths, and they lower them down. They work that scissor-like motion with the, with the shafts of the rakes. And when they feel like they've got a good catch of oysters in the in the baskets or the rakes, they bring it to the, the surface and dump it on a culling board when they sort out what they're not supposed to keep, the small oysters and the undesirable, you know, stuff that's found on the oyster bars. And they just basically shuck them right back in where they, they found shuck them? They, well, they push uh, all the un, un, yeah, not undesirable shuck them. They stuff. They just push, yeah. them, push yeah. them back in alive. Yeah, shuck, <laughs> shucking is another yes. term used with oysters, but yeah. not in this case. Uh -huh. But, uh, yeah, the, so that's the primary way the oysters are ca caught here in Maryland, at least in that at that time. Uh, there were also a fleet of uh, dredge boats. Uh, they're called skipjacks. They were created specifically for the harvest of oysters back in the 1880s or 1890s. And they worked... Uh, a couple of days a week, they were allowed to use uh, motor boats to push them, and on certain days of the week, other days they had to use sail power. So it was the last commercial fishing fleet, to my knowledge, in the world, and they still operate very, very limited today. They're pretty much a rare and endangered uh, craft. And how was the oyster population from then to today? And just I'm curious. Well, the oyster population in Maryland is, you know, dramatically lower than what it was at its peak. As back in the 1880s, I think they were harvesting like 15 million bushels a year. Wow. Uh, I think when I was working on the bay, it might have been, you know, 20,000 bushels uh, a year. And uh, today there's more aquaculture where they're commercially raising the oysters, mm -hmm. farming the oysters. And uh, I think the majority, I'm not an expert today, but uh, the, the majority of the oysters harvested today from the Bay are done so from aqua farming. Mm. 
Any other things you took from your coastal experience? I mean, uh, I want to get into the history, but it just that, that game warden cutting your teeth on the, that salt water area. I just, I, I know what it's like to, to be on the coast, a small coast of New Hampshire. Starting there, it's a different world. Yeah, well, the one the one thing was um, the boating activity. I, mm. I uh, was a canoer, but I had no experience in motor boats. So when I in the summertime, when dealing with the sailboats that would try to cross through shallow areas and get stuck, run aground, they call it, and then they'd expect uh, the police to get them out of the mud. So trying to you know move those boats from being stuck on the bottom and dealing with them in bad weather, and then just the the general boating violations that all of us game wardens experience when we're when we're patrolling the waterways, and then to a lesser extent the waterfowl hunting on the Chesapeake Bay. It, I didn't get a lot of exposure to that, but uh, it was quite different from the hunting I was used to here in Western Maryland. And it's substantial. That's like the place to, to waterfowl hunt on the East Coast. Yeah, well, the only the only real encounters I had with them were those that hunted from offshore blinds. Because uh, okay. at that time, the duties of the Natural Resources Police were sort of split between traditional game warden activity that worked just on the land primarily, and then the guys assigned to the patrol boats were doing the, the formerly marine police type duties. So mm-hmm. um, unless they were on an offshore blind, I didn't get to check a lot of waterfowl hunters or deal with a lot of waterfowl activity. But it was it was interesting and educational to experience all that. And, and is that where you kind of got your start with uh, being a historian and learning the history of the department? Well, y- yes and no. I... I uh, it was kind of funny. I, I was I had given notice to Hagerstown Police that I was leaving in two weeks, and I was also preparing for a, a drug case. I had worked undercover for Hagerstown and made a pretty substantial uh, drug distribution case. And I was at a meeting, and the assistant state's attorney that was prosecuting the case walked into the room, and he had heard that I was leaving and taking a position with the Natural Resources Police. And he looked at me, and he said, you're going to be an oyster policeman. And I didn't know what he was talking about. So when I went to work for the for the agency and, and was living out of a suitcase uh, down on the eastern shore initially, I went to a local museum down there that featured a lot of the watermen and oyster war history and, and learned a lot about it then. And there was also a, a famous novel written by Michener called uh, Chesapeake. And so I learned a lot about the early history of the Chesapeake Bay and the activities of the watermen by by reading that novel. So I had some interest in our history, but uh, I wouldn't say it was of any real significance. It wasn't until I came back to Western Maryland in 1989 that the uh, agency was in preparation to celebrate the 125th anniversary, which would have been in 1993. They got an early start questionnaire came from headquarters that all the troops were expected to complete. They asked what activities and different artifacts or materials would you like to see supporting the 125th anniversary of NRP. So like a good soldier, I filled out the form and suggested that we reproduce all of our early shoulder patches, offer them as a collector set. Well, they thought it was a great idea. They put me in charge of it and expected me to find examples of these original patches and have these reproductions made by a a commercial vendor in Mm -hmm. Baltimore. So in the process of trying to locate these original patches, I met a lot of retired officers officers and they love showing me their scrapbooks and telling me their war stories and that's when I really got the bug about our history. Oh, it's very very interesting and where where does the history of Maryland DNR police start? Well, it starts in 1868. Prior to that, I guess as early as the 1820s, the local watermen, most of whom were using those hand tongs we talked about earlier, Mm -hmm. were suddenly confronted by New England sailboats that had come into the bay after pretty much depleting most of the oysters in the New England states. And there were lots of oysters to be caught in the Chesapeake Bay, so they were using these large sailboats and dragging a heavy metal basket called a dredge behind them under sail power to scoop up oysters in large quantities. Mm. The local watermen saw that as a threat to their livelihood, so they convinced the General Assembly to outlaw the use of those dredge boats. And the General Assembly passed laws that supposedly would prohibit that activity, but obviously it didn't work with no police department out there to enforce it. So this went back and forth. Uh, the Civil War provided a, a brief uh, interruption to that kind of activity. But after the Civil War, the dredge boats were back at it pretty hot and heavy. So they passed a law in 1865 that allowed the use of the dredge boats but limited them to deep water 
and required them to have a license. But again, there was no police out there to enforce the law that was up mm-hmm. to the local sheriff, and so he had very little opportunity to do, make much of a dent in the in the oyster poaching that was occurring. So in 1868, the General Assembly created the State Oyster Police Force, and that eventually evolved into the Natural Resources Police today. Huh, so re- oysters were such a high-priced commodity back then that they wanted to protect those for residents of Maryland. It was uh, the biggest industry in Maryland, second only to agriculture. Wow. And with the advent of the locomotion, uh, locomotive trains and the expansion of the railroads, and even as far west as California during the gold rush, uh, oysters were a, a delicacy and people had money to spend on those luxuries of life and oysters were shipped all over the country. And a, a town like Crisfield, for example, it, it basically exists today because of the oyster industry of the late 1800s. Mm, very, very interesting. So Maryland took it pretty serious and started a enforcement. I'm assuming they started having issues if there's no enforcement out there. Just like today, if there's no enforcement out there, who's going to pay attention to the laws, huh? Right, exactly. In fact, the Oyster Police, uh, the history of that is, is, I think, fascinating. Advertised the position, I think there were five applicants. The, the successful applicant was a former Civil War naval veteran. His name was Hunter Davidson. He, at that time, after the war, had a position as a, um, in charge of the state journal for the state senate. He was very popular with the Maryland senators at the time. He got the position. And he, the first thing he did with his limited budget that he had was had a um, steam-powered side wheel paddle boat, steamboat, mm. uh, constructed in Baltimore. He didn't actually take possession of it till a year later. But and he also went to the Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond, Virginia and ordered a twelve pounder Dahlgren light boat howitzer. Mm. So this was a muzzle loading cannon and, and they were used extensively during the Civil War by the Navy on both sides. Uh, he recognized that in order to apprehend the violators using these big sailboats he would need to shoot the rigging out of the sailboat to, so they would stop and he could arrest them. And so it's I kind of compare it to what we call a stop stick today. The mm. violators trying to get away and you flatten his tires well in that case you use a 12 pounder howitzer with a shot charge in it to uh, bring down the sails of the sailboat and apprehend the violator this is serious police business huh i mean real serious we got cannons exactly well the the watermen at the time and we'll call them oyster pirates that was the common term used in the media back then there are many 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 accounts in the uh, newspapers of that era about these uh, conflicts with the oyster pirates. They called this, that period the oyster wars of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, it, they would, you know, they didn't have any respect for law enforcement, and if they saw a patrol boat coming, they'd just reach for their rifles and tried to deter the uh, apprehension of them and uh, deter the police boat from taking any action against them. They they saw the oysters as something there for the taking, and they weren't going to be uh, stopped by any law enforcement. Wow. So they have rifles, and now the now the police have cannons. <laughs> yeah, there were, there are many accounts of gun battles. Uh, I think one of the most famous, I believe, was about eighty eight, eighteen eighty eight. Uh, where five or six of these dredge boats had tied themselves together and were letting the wind push them towards an oncoming police boat, which was a steel-hulled, steam-powered, screw-driven uh, vessel. I think it's 113 feet long. It's a good size. Uh, he had just had uh, one of these cannons installed in the bow of the boat. Uh, it wasn't installed in such a way that he could lower the muzzle to aim at directly at the approaching boats. Meanwhile, the oyster pirates on these approaching boats are are shooting constantly with their <laughs> rifles at the at the police boat. He fired a couple of shots, and then, again, it went into the rigging, but it wasn't really effect causing the effect that he was looking for. And then he happened to think, well, I have a steel-hulled screw drill steam-powered vessel and they're using wooden sailboats <laughs> so he just rammed a few of these boats a couple of them sank and uh, by some accounts there were crew members who had been pretty much kidnapped shanghaied was the term that the captain didn't trust with the rifle so he would lock them below deck Ooh. and so many of those folks drowned during confrontations like that jeez It was a violent time. There was lots of uh, death and destruction fighting over oysters, not just between the police and the dredge boats, but but between the hand-tongers and the dredge boats. Uh, The dredge boats were supposed to stay in deep water, but when the weather was bad, it was so much more comfortable to be in the shallower rivers, and uh, the the tongers took offense to that, and they would have gun battles between the two of them, and 
it was a pretty pretty serious time. No, it sounds like gunfire going back and forth, cannon fire, ramming boats. And this is the state sworn police that are taking those uh, extents to protect the resource, basically. You know, the beginning of our, our conservation was, uh, yeah, don't take everything and harvest everything and go where you're supposed to go. And <laughs> we've got gun battles and cannon fire. And wow, that's, uh, I'm glad I wasn't a game warden back then. It sounds like a dangerous time. Oh, I, I imagine that it very, very much was. But the, one of the interesting things I noticed on all the newspaper accounts of these, of these uh, incidents, you know, they would apprehend the violators and take them to the justice of the peace, and they would pay their fines or be incarcerated for the oyster violations. There was never any mention of the fact that they were shooting at the police. <laughs> so I, I guess that was just to, to be accepted. You know, if you want to catch a poacher, you're going to get shot at, and that's just part of the game. I don't know. Yeah, and then maybe that time, turn of the century, that was that was acceptable behavior. I don't know, the wild, wild west, so to speak. Yeah, well, we're talking just 20 or 30 years after the Civil War, you know, so mm-hmm. I guess people were used to bloodshed and loss of life. But. And, and how many years were they armed like that to protect the oysters? I know you have a machine gun here in the in your... Um, in your museum that was mounted on an oyster boat, right? Uh, yeah, it it, uh, it was. They they used the muzzle loading cannons up until about 1891, when the general or the U.S. Congress authorized states to form naval militias. And since Maryland already had a navy via the oyster police, uh, they took advantage of what the government was offering. And they didn't offer any funding, but they did offer to supply through the army or the Navy, uh, one-pounder Hotchkiss breech-loading cannons. Mm. So they shot a much smaller projectile, 37-millimeter projectile, but a much higher velocity, and they could shoot a lot faster because they were breech-loaders. So most of the patrol boats were equipped with those, and I forget how many. There might have been seven or eight, maybe more, of those patrol boats with those types of guns on them. And also during that period and even a little earlier, the uh, oyster police, or the, at that time called the state fishery force, they would borrow not only cannons but Gatling guns from the Naval Academy. And uh, most of those, if not all, those guns were returned except for that one original cannon that was purchased by Hunter Davidson from the Red uh, Tredegar Ironworks. Now, that cannon was eventually donated to an American Legion, and uh, the state reacquired it by buying it outright from the Legion in 2010. But mm. in the 1930, well, those, those one pounder Hotchkiss were removed probably in the 1920s when they didn't see the need for such heavy duty firepower to deal with uh, conservation violations. <laughs> But in, in the 19, late 1930s and 40s, uh, there was a new phenomenon where the Virginia watermen that had these very fast and capable motorboats would sneak into the Maryland waterway and mostly the lower Potomac River and use these smaller dredges to illegally harvest oysters. And the, the fishery force personnel were so frustrated by the fact that they couldn't catch these high-speed boats, they asked uh, the Army to provide belt-fed, water-cooled, World War I-era machine guns to mount on the bow of the patrol boats as a deterrent to these Virginia uh, watermen who were violating Maryland law. And there are quite a few accounts in the papers of the time of, of the effective use of those guns to deter, if not apprehend, some of the violators. But I did not find any accounts of any one being actually struck and killed by a, a machine gun bullet. Uh, but those guns were removed from the vessels in 1946. We still have one in our inventory today, which is on loan here to me at this museum. Well, that's that's pretty interesting. And so the the time frame that these boats were armed heavily, a span of 40 years? Well, uh, from 1868 until uh, 1920. Uh, so, yeah, that'd be uh, 50 years. And then another brief window from 1937 until 1946 when they were armed with belt-fed machine guns. Okay. So, uh, again, very, very serious. This, this, this is taken very serious by everybody, you know, to, to arm, you know, fisheries, law enforcement to that degree. Well, again, it wasn't just because they were violating oyster laws; because they were shooting at the police. So, so you <laughs> good know, point. The way to win the, way to, the way to win the gunfight is bring a bigger gun. Bring a bring a gun, and so we have cannons and machine guns. So that nope, and, and I get that part. And what, were we effective uh, at, at 
you know, saving oysters or we have, you know, we talked about the, the numbers dropping. Is, was that an impact of that we weren't successful as law enforcement officers or do you think it was just the pollution of the time and taking the, the wrong type of oysters? And- well, over harvest has been one of the causes of the decline of oysters, but disease is pro- disease and pollution are probably the biggest factors. Okay. So a couple of diseases were introduced into the bay. One was called MSX, and I don't know what that means. And another one was called Dermo, and they, they uh, impacted the oysters dramatically. Okay. And they still suffer from that today, depending on the salinity of the bay. Right, and when the aquaculture is grown, they could actually control that type of stuff? Or well, they... no, it doesn't really affect them until they're like three years old, and by then the aquaculture are harvesting them. But okay. I'm, I'm not an expert about oyster disease. There's more information yeah. from DNR. No, I'm, yeah. I'm just wondering if the, the law enforcement was successful, and what would be your opinion after studying all this? Oh, it had it definitely had an impact. At least they kept the peace between the dredgers and the, and the tongers. It was Good a much point. safer occupation to be out there harvesting oysters than, than it was prior to the police. The the police were there as much to protect the oysters as they were to protect the watermen and keep the peace. And and there was also a phenomenon back in the late 1800s of uh, these dredge boat captains, many of whom were unscrupulous, and they needed crewmen to work on the boats. And you can imagine at that time in the cold winter months when, when oysters are traditionally harvested, it must have been a back-breaking job. They used a, a hand crank device called a windlass to drag that dredge back aboard the, the sailboat to, to after they filled it with oysters hmm. so uh, they couldn't find crewmen that were willing to work for the in those conditions and so they would hire uh, agents to uh, find unsuspecting victims basically <laughs> a lot of german immigrants for example were promised uh, wealth and uh, a great opportunity to make money as new arrivals to the country by working on one of these dredge boats and so many of these people ended up pretty much prisoners, uh, forced to work as slaves on, on these boats. One of the jobs of the state fishery force at that time was to find any of these uh, kidnapped individuals who were being mistreated and tortured practically uh, uh, while working on these boats in these terrible conditions. Many of the times at the end of the oyster season, they, these dredge boats would stay offshore all winter long, so there was no chance for escape. And instead of bringing them ashore and paying them a decent wage for their contribution to the harvest, uh, they would just uh, wait for them to not be watching and turn the wheel. The boom of the sail would knock them overboard and they would drown. So it was called paid off by the boom in, in the terminology of the day. Wow. That's uh, so in addition that's... to shooting at the police, kidnapping was another one of the roles of the police force to. Uh, find the victims of kidnapping and, and slave labor. Wow, we think we got it tough today. That's just uh that's just crazy t- sign of the times for sure. Yeah. That's uh significant for sure. As, as Maryland the police develop, I mean we 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 start off with these oyster police. When's the switch up come to, you know, thinking that we have to protect some inland stuff or do they stay separate? Do we have a marine division? Do we have a inland division? And how did Maryland accomplish all that in the, in the years to come? Well, in 1874, other duties were added to the Oyster Police. That's when they changed the name to the State Fishery Force, when they were responsible for enforcing other laws protecting fish, not mm-hmm. just oysters. Uh, in 1896, even though we've had game protecting laws since the 18th century, uh, the only law enforcement was... Um, Uh, pretty much the sheriff until 1896 when the state created the Office of State Game Warden. Mm -hmm. So that evolved in 1968 to the wildlife officer position. And then at the same time or a little earlier in 1964, they created the Maryland Marine Police from uh, uh, prior to that was the Tidewater Fisheries Police who succeeded the state fishery force. So it was pretty much separate. Some of their duties overlapped. There are accounts where during deer season, some of the Marine police would work with the wildlife officer. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until 1971 that the uh, Marine police and the wildlife officers were combined, creating the natural resources police that we have today. But even then, the duties were still very much separate. Uh, For example, when I started in 1984, I was assigned to a patrol boat, which... Uh, would have been, even though it wasn't officially a division, it was up until 1981, but when I was hired in 84, it was no longer officially a division, but the duties were definitely divided. Mm. So I would have to get in my personal vehicle and drive to my patrol boat station, hop on board the boat, and then I would be at work, as opposed to the 
inland activity, the game wardens, you know, he had a take home car and he'd hop in the car and pick up the radio and he was at work. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it was still separate, uh, but on paper, we, we all had the same uh, duties and worked for the same outfit. Mm. Uh, More recently, probably in the uh, late mid 1990s, uh, everybody got cars. So even the people assigned to patrol boats uh, still had a car and could do other activities outside of patrolling on the, on the waterways. Mm. And, uh, and then in 2005, another big merger happened when the majority of the law enforcement park rangers in the state uh, forest and park service were combined with the natural resources police and became natural resources police officers. So we assumed all the law enforcement responsibilities within the state parks at that time. Wow, big changes. Yeah, we've, uh, we've had quite a few uh, changes, quite a few mergers, and that's why we have such a great patch collection today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that, that's outstanding. You know, I always ask because it's kind of near and dear to my heart. You're, you're in the line of duty deaths. I mean, in those ages we talked about shooting back and forth. And did, you ha- did, did anybody ever acquire in the, in the early stages of Maryland? Was there in the line of duty death? Well, the uh, earliest one I'm aware of, I think, was in the 1890s. Uh, his name was Bromwell, as I recall. Um, he was uh, apparently knocked overboard by a, most of the boats that we used back at that time, even though we did have two or three uh, steam-powered sail, uh, screw-driven vessels. Most of the boats we used were sailboats. Wow. And he was knocked over accidentally uh, by the boom, and by the time they turned around and went back to catch him, it was in the wintertime, and he didn't yeah. make it. Uh, we had a couple other drownings, a heart attack from a, a, after a dive activity. But the only um, a, a officer killed in the line of duty from a felonious attack was in 1945, I think, when a game warden was off duty. He was coming home from church with his wife and saw a subject enter a field with a shotgun, and you can't hunt on Sunday. So uh, he took his wife home and dropped her off and went back to confront this man. It turned out he wasn't actually hunting. Hunting. It was, he had been involved in some sort of domestic and, and had left the house with a gun. And when uh, the game warden surprised him, his version of the story was he wheeled around and fired the gun and killed this uh, game warden. Mm, with a shotgun. His name was Gordon Barnes. Yeah. Okay. So they found, uh, they found his body the next day when he didn't return home and, and later apprehended the shooter in, uh, I think, in New Jersey. And he was convicted and, and eventually hung by the state of Maryland. Wow. That's a, that's an interesting story. Just uh, and it almost rings true today with our domestic violence, and we do assist a lot of other law enforcement officers. And the, the the times that you know I've been having issues sometimes is to helping the state police with the domestic violence, and that's basically what he ran into was a domestic violence issue in 1945. Yes, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, and he got right in the middle of that unknowingly, thinking mm-hmm. he was going to hunt on Sunday, and right. Yeah, so that's uh. The, that that's an interesting case, and and the fact that they hung him not too too long after, huh? No, it didn't take long. Justice was swift back then. Yes, yes, for sure. So yourself, I mean, you go from the waterways, and then then you come back. You want to go back home? Yeah, I I enjoyed my time on the Chesapeake Bay. It was a great experience, but I missed the mountains, and uh, I actually left the patrol boat only after I guess about two and a half years. I got a game warden's position. Uh, inland activity in Wicomico County, which is still on the eastern shore. But after 17 months of doing that, uh, uh, the corporal's position came up here in Washington County. I tested for it and was successful. So I got to come home and, uh, and you know, do the job of a lifetime. Yeah, the, in, the inland guy. Yep, the inland guy. Yeah, the, we, we didn't have any Marine Division out here in Western Maryland. That's all on the Chesapeake Bay and its tidal tributaries. Uh, and do you think, what do you think, that half the forest is marine, I mean, has those duties and half the forest? Or how is that divided in Maryland? Because you have a lot of water. I'm not the best guy to answer because okay. today the duties are so diversified mm-hmm. and everybody has a car. So you, right. could, you could be working in a park one day, you could be on a patrol boat another day, or mm-hmm. working hunting violations a third day. So exactly how that would break down. Yeah. Uh, every, everybody gets pretty much a piece of the pie all, all year round. I think you said about the diversity. You know, I think that's what we're seeing more and more is we're diversified. We're filling in gaps where the police in the woods, where the Swiss Army knife of law enforcement. You know, I've, I keep using these terms throughout my podcast because people are going to probably get sick of listening to me. But that, that, that's what the, the game warden is because that's what 
we are. We, we have to learn to adapt and overcome. <laughs> I stole that one too. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it did sound familiar. A- any stories that, of your career, uh, poaching stories or some interesting, sometimes I like funny stories too that th- some of the listeners enjoy funny and I probably should have prepped you on those things too. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can tell by the look on my face. Right? I know, it's exactly I, I, I'm right. I'm not real big on war stories. I mean, there are many, many uh, incidents that have happened in my career. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably the one I'd like to share most wasn't really a poaching story. It was about a tragic boating accident when I was working in Wicomico County. Um, I got a call in the middle of the night. Uh, it was the day at the very beginning of the Memorial Day weekend, a Friday night as I recall. Because I had volunteered to take some extra training on the detection of drunk boaters mm-hmm. uh, and had in fact developed a training program for the Coast Guard when I was temporarily assigned to the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Uh, it just happened to be, you know, my luck of the draw that uh, I was working in Wicomico County when one of one if not the worst recreational boating accident in Maryland's history occurred in 1988. Mm. And in this case, uh, an operator who was drunk and under the influence of drugs uh, had, I think, six members of his party on a speedboat. And he was in the Asselwoman Bay area of Ocean City and uh, 1030 at night and high speed traveling up the bay and struck another boat that was just drifting in the in the water had two people on board and four people died from that accident and Mm. it was a pretty horrific thing and violator served five years in the penitentiary for four uh, manslaughter convictions wow and when that happens i mean uh, boating investigations are really i mean you're on the water your evidence is floating that, that that's a chore in itself, isn't it? Well, it was. I mean, I, I my role initially was to go to the hospital and determine who was operating what and mm-hmm. and if any alcohol was involved. So I obtained blood samples uh, through, from every victim that made it to the hospital, and one of them was the operator of the at fault vessel. And between that and the very extensive investigation done by one of our investigators. You know, we had a great case against him. He had been, you know, using marijuana and snorting cocaine and drinking heavily all evening. And uh, so he pled guilty to one count of manslaughter and served five years. Mm. Did he admit to you he was the operator? Oh, yeah. he had. Well, the witnesses that were there, they they all knew who the operator was. Ironically, he had the least of the injuries. He, uh, Mm. He was, they were all thrown from his vessel. He swam to the vessel that he struck. One, his brother-in-law, he had only been married for a week, but his new brother-in-law, I think, swam to shore. But four of his passengers were in the water while this motorboat that he had been operating had the throttle wide open and just kept turning around in circles at high speed, striking these victims. Mm. And it was a pretty horrific scene. Wow, I can imagine. That's why I gave that adjective to probably one of the worst boating accidents in your history. Yeah. 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 And then, and then uh, I guess bad luck followed me because I came back to Washington County not long, long after that. And that, that very first summer, we had a lot of heavy rain all summer long. The Potomac River here in Western Maryland maintained high levels. And a lot of the people that liked to kayak and canoe and, and use inner tubes to float the creek and were used to low water in the middle of the summer mm-hmm. and got into trouble. And we had uh, 13 drownings that summer. So that was wow. a, a summer from you know the deep, dark places, too, to put up with all that yeah and that just tells me how much boat responsibilities you guys have and conservation officers have across the country uh, we're unique in new hampshire we have a marine patrol that does like the boating accidents and the boating rules but we're out there and we still have the same responsibilities and we can also enforce those types of laws but they, they're their primary but you guys are the primary you're you're dealing with all that and you're you're you know, that's just a, it's, it's a whole responsibility, especially when it's hot and people are recreating, like you said, the, people don't respect water, low head dams, uh, life jackets, life jackets, life jackets, you know, they just, uh, what we see out there, it, it just, when I, when I go hunting, Hunter Orange, for sure, because it's what I've seen because of Hunter involved shootings. You know, I wear Hunter Orange because I believe in it because I've seen what happens out there. And I'm sure you could tell life jackets, life jackets, life jackets from 
a lot of these experiences. How many of those people would have saved if they had life jackets on? Uh, as I recall, the majority of them. I mean, yeah, I, um, yeah, almost every one. And that that incident. Now, I, mm-hmm. we had a few incidents where collisions occurred, and a life jacket didn't really help. But most most cases, they probably would have survived if they'd have been wearing a life jacket. Right. And the same way with the blaze orange. I mean, I had a lot of uh, shooting victims that, uh, you know, mostly during turkey season in the fall here in Western Maryland, you can use a rifle, and uh, you know. You can use a rifle to shoot turkeys? In the fall in western Maryland. Yeah. Wow. And uh, people convince themselves that the sound they heard or the movement they saw was a turkey, and they pulled the trigger, and it's too late. So. Wow. Now, that's something that surprises me, you know, that the, a lot of your hunting-related shootings are from turkeys with rifle, turkey hunting with rifles in the fall. Interesting. I just, some of, not some a lot of, them. of, but some of, yeah. Some of them, yeah. But, and that's some that I would ever experience because we can't hunt with a rifle in New Hampshire. and that's the first time. Uh, is there are a lot of states you know or have it that just general information. I, I don't know. Okay, it's been a tradition here in Western Maryland. I, yeah, no, I I, I totally understand. Uh, sometimes traditions we have to take a look at those and uh, sometimes reevaluate. <laughs> 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 That's why we have uh, life preserver laws, and some states have hunter orange requirements, and some have recommendations. But I, as a game warden, and you as a game warden, would have recommended hunter orange, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. I've, I've been in front of hunter safety classes, and, and they didn't want to hear it. But I said, look, I know that you think turkeys can see orange, and they, maybe they can, but you could still hang some in a tree somewhere to let the other hunters know you're in the area because, you know, just too much uh, sadness from and yep. for the families of the, and even the survivors uh, or the, vic- or the shooter's family and his the rest of his life is impacted by a, a mistake. It mm-hmm. could have good been prevented point. if there had been more visible. Yep, good point about hanging an orange in the tree if you're going to be sitting right there and giving somebody a heads up for sure. I still t- teach hunter safety, and one of my requirements is you wear hunter orange to my class. So whether it's a field day or, or whatever, it's it's hunter orange, so you get in that habit of, of wearing that. So. Well, it's it's required even of landowners today. Up until a few years ago, a landowner didn't have to wear orange. And mm. I mean, I'm a landowner. I have 21 acres, and I always wear orange when I'm when yeah I'm on. it's just smart and the, the hunting incidents that we've seen that, that could have been prevented by some orange is just right. like you said the tragedy that families have to endure over you a little inconvenienced and maybe not get that turkey or get that deer by by wearing a little orange so um yeah that, that those are pretty tragic you know in western maryland did you, you have boating you have search and rescue missions out here hundred lost hunters that type of thing or? occasionally a little farther west in green ridge state forest some of those areas we've we've had a few search and rescue we have a team dedicated to that we have a group of volunteers called our reserve officers and they have a team that's so uh, very well trained in search and rescue and, and the at the appalachian trail runs right through this general area it does, but uh, the Appalachian Trail isn't isn't really that remote. It'd be pretty hard to get lost Is on it? the Appalachian Trail. So, <laughs> not, not like New Hampshire. <laughs> yeah, in fact, the Appalachian Trail is very close to where we're sitting today. It, uh, it's right here next to the Greenbrier State Park. It's part of the South Mountain Recreation Area, which includes Greenbrier State Park, and that's pretty much where I live, right next to it. So. Neat. Neat. That's neat to have it so close, and uh, it's it's pretty close to my house up north too. You know, all the way from uh, Maryland to New Hampshire, uh, we got a connection there with the AT. But through the years, you've you've developed uh, this desire, this uh, hobby, so to speak, about Maryland history, Maryland DNR police history. Right, right. Well, again, as I mentioned earlier, in 1993, they had the 125th anniversary, and I created uh, 200 collector sets of reproduction shoulder patches that we wore through the ages. And uh, from that, I expanded and collected badges and then uniforms and then everything I could get my hands on. A lot of publications, a lot of documents, just general information about our history, not just the Natural Resources Police, but all the units of DNR. Uh, Forest and Park Service, in fact, the biggest collection here is related to Forest and Parks. Mm. And uh, to some extent, the Wildlife Division and uh, a little bit of program open space and things like that. Yeah, because you took those history f- before they merged and you kind of merged them here, but you took all their old history and brought those those together, the forestry, the e- parks. and Exactly. The Department of Natural Resources were created was created just 50 years ago. Mm. They just celebrated their 50th anniversary. And, and I had uh, an opportunity to help uh, some of the folks that are currently working for DNR promote that history by articles they had written for uh, the publication that DNR puts out called the Maryland Natural Resource. It's a magazine and, uh, and on their website and things like that. So 
the resources that I have here for historians, and quite a few have been here doing research. Uh, a couple of park rangers, uh, volunteer park rangers, wrote uh, a book about the history of Patapsco State Park here in Maryland, and they spent a couple days here doing research with the collection that I have accumulated over the years. Awesome. Awesome. And you're, you're kind of archiving for all of those currently, even though you're not an official DNR museum, you, you are the archiver, you're the historian, unofficially, I'm assuming. Uh, well, I guess it's you could describe it as official as far as the Natural Resources Police historian. I, I, that's included on my business card. And, it, okay. Uh, I get a lot of, well, a few anyway, if not a lot, uh, calls or emails from headquarters where somebody from the public asks a question about our history and nobody there could answer the question. <laughs> they refer it to me. Um, and again, I provided a lot of information to different groups and uh, I maintain a Facebook page. Uh, it's called Maryland Conservation History. There are hundreds and hundreds of old photographs and documents the, related to DNR history and the, and the history of the natural resources police i've been on a couple of other podcasts uh, maryland public television featured the oyster wars cannon the machine gun and my collection here on chesapeake collectibles a couple years ago so i'm, I'm happy to share the information that i have uh, but again it's a private collection that uh, has grown a lot since i built this uh, building when people realize what I was trying to do is basically save everything from the dumpster, which is where mm. a lot of it ends up, I'm hoping that eventually the state will recognize that this effort is worthwhile and provide a facility that would be more public and official than uh, my uh, effort here. Not something you could share with the public, something that, I mean, when I walked through the doors, I was in awe. So I, I guess I'd, you and I would both like to see the public walk through the doors and be in awe. Yeah, well, I do. I do. Um, offer the facility to different groups. In fact, there's a group meeting here tomorrow night, but, uh, and I host a lot of the retired officers uh, at a Christmas luncheon every December. So I'm, I'm trying to share it without being a, an official, you know, publicly uh, advertised mm -hmm. museum because it's not that. It's a, it's a private affair. No, but it's a, it's a private affair that has uh, a public impact, if you ask me, or certainly had an impact on me as, a, as another game warden coming from another state to walk in here and just imagining that maybe New Hampshire, and I don't even know if we could get this much stuff together, s seeing that type of stuff. And uh, it's, it's, inspi it's inspiring because I think our history is so important to preserve for our future. I agree. I agree. They invite me back to every new academy class on the second day to give them three hours of uh, NRP history, whether they want to hear it or not. But uh, and I enjoy doing that very much. And that's so important. I, I'm I'm so happy that they're doing that because it gives them their roots. It gets them their their uh, foundation. And I I always go back to I did a podcast with uh, one of the Pennsylvania DNR guys, Abe, and he tells me going through the academy as he walks down, he sees the pictures of the academy classes, and he he talks about the history there by by watching them. And I said to him, I'm like, and this will be in another podcast too, because I, I said to him, I said, so you will be able to see the first woman that was in the academy class, and he's like, yeah. And I said, and he, he's ethnic, he's dark-skinned, he's Indian, and uh, Guyana, as his mother's from Guyana. You're going to see the first ethnic guy in those pictures, and it's going to be you. And it's, that's part of the Pennsylvania history. And he's so proud of the history before that, and I'm the one that brought that up. But it's just kind of neat that, that new guys going through an academy can appreciate those that have come before them in the history of the beginnings, starting with oyster police, moving up to DNR police, the fisheries police, you know, it's just the, 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 the process and where 20 or 30 years is going to bring us again in the metamorphosis of uh, conservation law enforcement nationwide, internationally. So, and I, hey, thanks for sharing with me. It's, it's, it's been an awesome experience. Oh, it's my pleasure. In closing, anything? Because uh, I always like to give my uh, interviewee anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to cover, things like that. It's kind of, kind of, it's as much your podcast as this is my podcast. <laughs> no, I, I just like to remind your listeners that you know if you're approaching retirement and you've accumulated uh, you know some memorabilia or some interesting documents, uh, you know even war stories. Uh, you know, please preserve them and, and uh, pass them on to the next generation. If you don't have a facility like this or uh, something even more significant, uh, you know, just uh, don't uh, throw them in the dumpster. I see so much of that and it's, it's mm. disheartening, you know. 
Right. And if you're in administration and you're listening, maybe we need to have a, a designated historian within the department and start making working on a place that we can uh, display this stuff. Yeah, well, that that's a great suggestion. In fact, I went to a meeting yesterday with a state archivist when different uh, institutions from all over the state, some very small little, little local historical societies and, and some very big. Uh, one was a DOD uh, medical museum professional and, and they talked about the challenges with funding and, mm. and, and the proper storage of archives and protecting them from mold and mildew and and all of that and, and there's that a lot was, to that, it isn't there that was a common theme that you know different uh, agency heads need to take responsibility for preserving history and uh, making sure those archives are protected and and uh, available for research and and uh, promoting their their agency and you're in the process, Greg, of like uh, I asked you about photographing and making digital digital records and kind of doing that stuff. I mean, you said you'd be 90 something before you ever get completed. But. <laughs> well, that's, it's a long term goal. I mean, I plan to head for retirement. I have a lot of other activities I'm involved in. <laughs> and as long as I'm physically fit, I have a limited amount of time to spend here doing a digitization and, mm-hmm. and cataloging. But eventually I'll have more time when I'm too feeble to do the hard work. Uh, so I, I uh, hopefully will uh, get all of this stuff digitized and it'll be available to the world online yeah. currently there are hundreds and hundreds of photographs that i mentioned earlier on, on that the, facebook, on the facebook page. page but uh, eventually i'd like to see um, much more information out there at the click of a mouse yeah well it's it's been outstanding and uh, th- thank you very much for taking the time and sharing you know the history and sharing your passion and uh yeah it's just uh, looking around the room i'm just uh, i'm still overwhelmed and uh I was just really appreciative there's people like you out there doing this. And even on a small scale, there's people. And I know this is probably on the larger scale. Now, it's, uh, I appreciate of all those people that uh, try to save our history and share it with the future generations, law enforcement or non-law enforcement. Well, thank you. And I appreciate you and your effort uh, promoting conservation law enforcement and making people aware of what we do and why we do it. Great. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun, all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experiences of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from Game Wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion, the commitment, and the stories of those men and women that call themselves Game Wardens. This is Game Warden, Wayne Saunders, and this is Warden's Watch.